as a child growing up, the war was just there. It was, it was, uh, it was a constant. It wasn't born in a time of peace and grew up in, uh, you know, in the 1940s or 50s, and then see these changes come about. It was a, it was pretty constant at that point. I think that all the Vietnamese, I would say so, want the French out. So the 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 tragedy of Vietnam was that the nationalist movement was not only nationalist but was communist. Uh, you know, my experience may be different from that of the uh, the quote typical Vietnamese American person, because uh, as you know, I was born in Hue, Vietnam, 1961, but then when I was just a year and a half, uh, your grandparents moved to Chicago because they were getting their PhD degrees. So I left Vietnam with them in 1963, uh, and we lived in Chicago until 1967. We were, we went to Chicago as uh, faculty members of the University of Way. So there was a, a commitment on our part we were supposed to return. So in our mind there was no question that once we finish, we will return. At that point, uh, before we, um, we return, many friends came and asked us whether we were mad in returning to Vietnam to a war-torn country with two kids. But, uh, of course, uh, uh, we had no choice. Uh, came back right before the Tet Offensive. So we were just back for a few months when, uh, when the Tet Offensive occurred and, and our home was overrun. I don't know if you, did you know that story, that we were out visiting uh, Yi Li, uh, your, my mother's older sister, because we had learned that her son, oldest son had just gotten drafted, and so we knew she'd be very upset by the news. So we went and visited her uh, from one part of Saigon to another, and while we were visiting her, the part of Saigon that we lived in was overrun. And so that whole area of the city was just lost, and we couldn't go back. So that visit ended up being, uh, I think, a, a three-month or six-month visit. We had to just move in with her. And I think it was the next day, we, we turned on the news and we saw soldiers you know, shooting out of our home because that's where the, um, the, the Viet Cong had taken over our home and they were using uh, my parents' books because all the books were still packed in boxes from coming back from the United States and those books were like sandbags and when we finally did come back to our home it had been uh, kind of gutted, bombed out, the kitchen had a big crater in it and all these books had bullets in them. And my sister and I, we would uh, open up these books and try to we'd play a game, like, we guess which books have bullets in them, you know, it's kind of like a little lottery thing. You saw soldiers everywhere. The newspapers, the, the stories in newspapers are always dominated by the war front, which province has been lost, which has been regained. In the cities, there's curfew every night. So at, at a certain uh, time in the evening, the sirens would go off, and, and that meant that you had uh, half an hour, there was like a warning, you had half an hour to be off the street, so if you were visiting someone, you heard the siren, that was time to go out and get on your way home. Um, and uh, everywhere you went in the streets, there were propaganda ban banners, um, you know, the news, uh, so, so everything has to do with the war. Ho Chi Minh had this aura of austerity and uh, kind of self-sacrifice uh, that I think was very appealing to a lot of people in stark contrast to the excesses that we would see in um, the generals and the politicians of South Vietnam. On the other hand, we, we had a life. We had a, we had a good life. I went to, I went to school, um, you know, I'm always working, trying to establish this university, uh, but always uh, trying to set up a law practice She's, um, so they weren't they weren't just rich people who had inherited a lot of them. I mean they had kind of uh, become self-educated uh, worked their, you know gotten scholarships and, and so um, they were in the process of building 
uh, something and and really contributing to that South Vietnamese society. And we felt like if we didn't have the war draining resources, people, that we would, that Vietnam would advance, would, we would be okay. And um, we, I think a lot of people just wanted just the war to stop, that weren't so concerned about this, you know, reunification right then, because uh, we didn't really, really, most people in the South did not want a communist way of life. Of course, everyone wants to have a country unified, but not, you know, at the expense of the lack of freedom uh, for South Vietnam. If unification means um, uh, communist control, that, we, that that's what people are fighting against. Not against the unification of the country, but against the communist taking over by by the communist people in South Vietnam really saw this um, saw the the war as it's like the U.S. right a war of northern aggression. There was no doubt um, in our mind about um, the, the the reason why the the U.S. was in Vietnam. It was it was completely different from. The, the, the reason why the French were there. The French were there because they wanted to colonize, uh, because Vietnam was a colony. They, they, they went there to um, exploit the, the resources and to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to colonize uh, Vietnam. But the, the U.S. was there to help the South Vietnamese government. The American presence was, was critical in, in South now, not only culturally, certainly culturally, you had the music, you had American movies, um, the American military presence felt because you saw American soldiers everywhere, and you had uh, businesses and um, that were catering to the American presence there. So it was a big economic and cultural influence. But also, Vietnamese people knew that they were really reliant on American aid to keep fighting this war. And so, so we were hyper um, attuned to, the, to American politics. We followed American elections. And, you know, is this, this American politician, is he going to be more likely to support the war? Is this person talking about cutting aid and pulling out of Vietnam? We followed this with a great deal of interest. Um, well, you know, I, ca I came back from Chicago as a six-year-old speaking right. English. And so for me, American soldiers were an opportunity to go up and, and speak English and practice my, my language skills. So six, seven, eight years old. And um, so whenever we see an American at a restaurant or something, or I would go up and, and, and say, hi, my name's Coy, where are you from? I know Chicago, I grew up in Chicago. You know, and, and, my, and my interactions with them were all were pretty positive because these these um, these soldiers who were really just kids, 18, 19 years old, I think what the average age of a soldier in Vietnam was eight 19. and a half or nineteen. They were they were a really friendly group. They were like college freshmen, right? So for them to have to have some Vietnamese person come up who wasn't trying to sell them something or uh, you know get something from them, but it was just there to chat. I think they were they were very friendly to me. Noi, my father, had become the president of the University of Hue uh, during those years. And he was away uh, that spring of 1975 at a conference in uh, somewhere else in uh, Southeast Asia, I believe. And while he was away, Hue was overrun, it fell. And the, the whole University of Hue, the, uh, not the whole university, but many of the administration and the professors and students fled to Da Nang, which is over uh, this mountain range. And they were setting up this kind of uh, temporary university in Da Nang. And when um, my father came back, when your grandfather came back from, uh, from abroad, he decided, uh, this was now the end of March 1975, that he would fly out from Saigon to Da Nang to try to, to kind of uh, organize this uh, 
this temporary university and, and to see what help he could give to the students and the professor refugees. And, and it was really against probably his better judgment to go. And it was against the advice of most people because Da Nang had, was under attack at that time. But he was able to get a flight and just felt that, like, that it was his duty to go. And while he was in Da Nang, Da Nang fell. And the reports that we got were that uh, he had been captured and executed, actually. And so right, right at the end of March, uh, people started coming by our home. I remember one day when people were coming by to offer their condolences on our loss. But um, the next morning, we got news that he had, in fact, escaped uh, and was safe on a ship that was sailing south. So he got back to... Um, Saigon uh, right at the end of March and and he had seen the, the panic in the city from the troops and the, this large uh, boat that he'd gotten out on um, a, a huge portion of the of the refugees on on this boat were actually the army and they had forced their way on um, with their weapons and and so when Omnoy saw um, that level of panic amongst the soldiers, he knew that this uh, this was not the normal ebb and flow of the war uh, going back and forth. This, he felt like this was the end. So, and he also knew that uh, things would not be so good for him if if we stayed in Vietnam. Felt because when he was in Nang, you know, they they had put out a warrant for his arrest and his and his execution. So. So he and uh, and your grandmother decided that we we needed to leave. The uh, person who was head of mobile oil in Vietnam, uh, a man named Peter Gelke, was had become really close to our family, and he had told uh, Banoi, uh, my mother, that that he would try to assist us in leaving the country if we would like to do so. It wasn't legal to leave at that time, so you really had to to have some kind of uh, way of getting on a ship or a boat or a plane or something to get out. So they uh, made this plan, I think on March 31st, and they told uh, the children, they told me and my sister on April 1st, on April Fool's Day, they said we're going to be leaving. And, uh, and we're leaving tomorrow. So when the opportunity came, and in fact it came very suddenly, moments before we didn't even know, we didn't think of, we had no idea that we were going to leave the country. We had no preparation whatsoever. We just, as though we just dropped everything and, uh, and went because we had to, we had only warning only a few hours before we, in fact just, just the, the afternoon before and we, we left at 8 o'clock the next morning. We're upset. And it's, on, on one hand there's, there's some excitement with this kind of adventure we're gonna, you know, go somewhere else, but, but it, it, was, it meant saying goodbye to everything. And we knew we would, would not come back, not in the foreseeable future. So on April 2nd, uh, we, this was the plan. We, we got up, uh, just like a usual day, um, and um, I rode my bike to, to my aunt's house, my father's older sister who was just a few blocks away and a few blocks from my school. And I left my bicycle there with her, and, and she knew that we were leaving. So we said goodbye, and then I, I walked to my school, but rather than going all the way into my school, I went into a cathedral that was right next to my school. It's the main cathedral in Saigon. We met there early in the morning, and from there it's only a two-block walk over to Peter Gelbke's home. Um, and Peter met us there, and. Uh, then he had his car, he went with us, of course, that took us out to the airport. Now, when we got to the airport, uh, airport's really under tight security all through the war years. 
and the security guard, uh, we were hoping that they would just see that, you know, it's Peter Gelke's car, oil, oil, and just kind of flag us through. But the security guard uh, there actually um, t stopped us and uh, just kind of like did a random check and asked your grandmother to show for some paperwork showing that she actually had some business at the airport that she had a reason for being there. Um, and I think <laughs> pretty much everyone in the car thought the game was up at that point, that we wouldn't be able to get through the airport because we, we did not have any official business there. But um, Benoit, like a magician, pulled out this airport pass. Uh, and it turned out that a few months before, she had done a legal favor with somebody and the only way they could repay her, uh, they didn't have much money, so this she did that just as a pro bono thing. But this person worked at the airport, so he said, well, I'm going to give you an airport pass. And so he gave it to her, so she accepted it just so that he wouldn't lose any face, but she's, she didn't really think she'd need an airport pass, so she just stuck it in her purse. And it was still in her purse, and she realized it that day when this security guard was pointing the gun at at us. So she pulled out this this uh, card. <laughs> it was just one of these many miracles that we that we had during those, that week and, and the weeks to come. So we got on, got into the airport, we got on a helicopter, and um, it, it dropped us onto the, uh, not right onto the oil rig, but there, these oil rigs obviously have a huge workforce, and there is a, a provider ship that, it's kind of like a freighter that brings men and supplies, and things like that, to the men on the oil, to the oil rig. And so they dropped us onto that, large ship. Um, we spent about a week on that ship. That ship eventually dropped us off in Singapore. And from Singapore, we flew to France, uh, where we kind of figured out what the next step would be. And how old were you at the time? I was 14. I was 14. When we left Vietnam, we had no idea where we went. And we did not care. For, for us, what was important was to get out of Vietnam, not to go, not where to go. And we were in France April, May, June, so my parents heard that, well, she might as well apply to colleges while she's there. <laughs> Obviously, she could write a pretty good essay about her experiences. Um, so she, she was doing that college application thing, and my parents were looking for jobs. For me, it was it was pretty easy because I didn't really have to plan out much of a next step. But then from France, they applied for asylum to two countries, uh, and because of their English-speaking background, they decided it would be either the United States or Australia. At that point, in 1975, we decided we did not go, know where we were going to go, but we knew where we did not want to go. It was the U.S. It, it was um, rather ironical, now that we are in the U.S., to t that, that we tell you that in 1975, when we had to make the decision, we, uh, we make the decision against the U.S. Why? Because for us, at that time, it was very painful for us to leave Vietnam. But, and for us, the U.S. and the Vietnam were like twins. So to leave Vietnam and to go to the U.S. is just like Vietnam all over again. So we said, we want to make, if we want to leave Vietnam, we want to make a new life out of this. We want to start over. So we won't start over, we won't be, we wouldn't be able to start over if we went to the U.S. That was our thinking at that time. At that point, uh, this is now in June, they, when we were making this decision, Mimi had been accepted to Harvard. And so we thought, well, let's go there first. Mimi will be at Harvard. And uh, we'll just try out the United States if, if it's not a good place to live, if, there's, if it's hostile, if, if they can't find good work. Then at that point, we'll move to Australia. From there, they, they were sending out these applications, and, and Notre Dame and South Bend offered both of them jobs. So that's, that was our next step. And 
1975 and the war and the refugees, it's on everybody's mind. And here you are, one of these refugees. So, so teachers pay a lot of attention. I think class, the classmates were very kind, curious. But of course, um, these are high school years and you really kind of stick out there. We had very few African American students as well. It was just a white kind of Catholic group. And so I think there was some kind of um, random meanness that you one might, might expect. Uh, there wasn't any violence or anything like that, but there was maybe some, some meanness and some ignorance there. But for the most part, people were very kind. Our second year at South Bend, we moved into a new home, into this this area in the kind of suburbs. And I think our first morning out there, our home had eggs you know, all over. So that was, I remember sitting, being outside there with my mother, kind of, we were um, just kind of scrubbing these garage doors, trying to get the eggs off. And by the way, saying, this is the work of bigots. <laughs> Yeah, I figured that one out. <laughs> and some people in school would would ask, you know, really kind of dumb questions or or kind of make teasing remarks about what our food might be like or what our language sounded like, things like that. But mostly they were very ignorant because they couldn't get Vietnam and Korea and China and Japan, all these things separated out. So I was kind of like representing most of Asia to them. <laughs> I remember once I was in South Bend, Indiana, I read in the local newspaper a letter to the editor, something about, you know, those, they call us the boat people, all those boat people, they came and uh, took out jobs, that kind of thing, and then there was an answer to that uh, letter, you know, uh, it is said that we are all about people. You know, the people of the U.S., we are all about people. We are all immigrants. So, you know, it's, uh, so it's really, you know, it's nice. There's uh, some people who, you know, who, uh, you know, sympathize. So the, the war would come up. We had a U.S. history class, and the war was at kind of the end of the year. And where we talk about literature, and, and so you know, I think my experiences were people wanted to hear what my perspective would be, and sometimes it became a little bit of a burden because I couldn't just speak to that piece of literature. I, it always had to be covered by well, as a Vietnamese American, what do you think? And so it it was a little bit uh, limiting and got a little bit old at, at some points. So people were always looking for me to represent. Uh, this group, or, I, I, or at least I felt that way, maybe they, maybe they weren't, but I always felt that, that whatever I did, I was not just being judged as a person, but people, because they had such limited exposure to Vietnamese Americans, or to Vietnam, that whatever I do would be taken as representative of an entire people. A, a common question was, uh, do you resent the United States for the war, uh, and I, I think there's a there was this sense of guilt on the part of a lot of Americans that somehow that the United States had uh, been very insensitive, very ignorant of things, had come in and with a very heavy hand had wrought all this damage. And I think for the most part, the most American public they're sending their their young sons over brothers or husbands over, um, and the motives were, on the mo for the most part, uh, maybe even somewhat noble. You know, they, they really felt like, here's this country that is under threat of being overrun by a communist regime, and uh, a lot of, or millions of people really don't want to live under a communist government, and that not only would this affect this particular group, but it then might spread to affect other neighboring countries that are interested in democratic governments. Um, and so I think if you look late 1950s, early 1960s, there's this real sense in America that a communist way of life is not the way that, is not the preferred way of life. 
and so they were willing to, to fight to try to, to stop communism. Well, I, I don't feel resentment. Uh, I think each country, you know, we have to make decisions based on the national interest. I think we have to be realistic about that. And it was um, not in the national interest of, the, of America, of the U.S., to continue to pursue the war or to help or to, 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 be, to be, um, be in Vietnam. So, I, we, we did not like it when America pulled out of South Vietnam, but we understand it. Um, we, and then, then that just... I, it's, it's not, not a question of resenting the decision. I mean, we, un we understood why America had to do that way, to, to go that route. You can't resent um, things that people do that are well motivated. You might regret the actions, but I think it would be very, very hard to hold, to be, um, to hold a, for me, to hold a grudge against people who are sending their sons, daughters, husbands, brothers, you know, children over to, to fight and die in this place. Mm -hmm. I would love to, to live in Vietnam without a communist government. I, I, I think about it often, but, it, but probably it's not going to happen. But sure, it's the food, the customs, the, it's all very familiar, and it's but, but my life is, um, is here now, so I think it would be hard to go back. In a way, I would love to go back to Vietnam. I, I would love to, to go and see, because Vietnam is... I am an American now, but Vietnam is still in my heart. It is, Vietnam is still my country. The Vietnamese people are still my, my, my people. It's, it's not a foreign country to me. Um, it is very much very close, very close to my heart. So I haven't, I have not made up my mind that I will, I will not go back. But I don't know. I don't know when I will do. I will go back. No, I